Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth of Your Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Good afternoon, guys. How are you? Doing great, Eric. How are you today? Good afternoon, Eric. Doing great. I am, uh, you know, it's the beginning of 2019 and there's a lot of things going on. We're all busy and I am actually really looking forward to this podcast. Uh, but before we get too deep into this, I'm hoping you will allow me to read something to our audience and you, but mainly our audience. Yeah, please. All right. So uh, for those that are listening, I want to tell you two things right off the bat. Number one, your brain's fine. Your, your brain is okay. There's nothing wrong with your brain. Number two, there's nothing wrong with my brain. I mean, don't ask my wife that question, but there's really <laughs> nothing wrong with my brain. But I'm going to say something to you that you might not understand. <clears throat> so here we go. Ning, dap, ding, grat, grut, grit, illet, crat, crut, clat, clut, Q-tip, slats, and cupert. Okay. Those are just a handful of the types of trusts that are out there. Those are all acronyms, but boy, does that get confusing. It's not a foreign language. Well, I'd like to say that, but it is kind of a foreign language. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about trust today in, in an overall arching theme of seven asset protection risks facing high net worth families and how trusts can assist in avoiding them. And that's a mouthful. Michael, how are you? I'm I'm great, Eric. How are you? Yes, uh, <laughs> Whew, uh, we attorneys read. really love acronyms, so uh, you, you did a pretty good job with uh, with all those uh, very bad, quickly. Eric. Well, thank uh, you. Tongue yeah. twister there. Yeah, it gets a little confusing. It's like a Dr. Seuss almost at one point. Yeah. Uh, so, Michael, you're a JD, and that's your main role at Copper Beach. Yes. Can you explain to the audience what JD means and what that role is? Uh, sure. The, the JD stands for Juris Doctor, which is if you go to law school and you pass through the curriculum, the degree you get is the Juris Doctor, which is if you are, are so inclined to then take the bar exam, you then become an Esquire, which is the term for act, an actual uh, attorney, licensed attorney. So the JD is, is really someone who goes to law school and gets the degree. But there are quite a few people out there that don't decide to go and get their uh, law license. They just take the degree and maybe do something else with it. Mm -hmm. And that's what that JD signifies. Got it. All right. So your role is to coordinate your services with your client's attorney. And, and part of that is exactly what we're talking about today. So where do we start with the asset protection risk? And I, and I believe there's, there's seven, you said, and we're probably going to break this into a couple podcasts. Uh, but where yeah. do we start today? Yeah, but I think there's seven, I would say, major ones, although I'm sure that there are <laughs> probably way more than that when you really dig down. But but we really like to focus on seven uh, that, that, that are sort of form commonplace or commonplace with most of the families that we work with. All right. We've got seven of them to cover uh, and, and some of them during this podcast, some during future podcasts. But let's start at number one. What's the number one risk? Well, the, no the number one risk that we talk with with a lot of the families are really lawsuits and and sort of when we talk about asset protection I, I like to look at it as as sort of living asset protection which is usually let's say the wealth creators who are interested in protecting the assets that that they have uh, in their ownership um, whether it's a business asset or some of the other assets that they have so that's lifetime asset protection and then some of the other risks that we'll risk that we'll talk about involve generational uh, asset protection, maybe for descendants and children via the estate plan. So those are the two major things. Uh, but now the first one, as I said, is potential lawsuits, which really a lot of the families that that we work with are either uh, business owners, medical professionals. They're they're highly highly concerned about legal liability that they may have um, due to their let's say perceived deep pockets mm -hmm. being a high net worth. Uh, family or individual, uh, high income earners. Uh, there are certain states in the, in the country, and every state has their own laws around sort of legal liability, whether that's in the tort context or or um, some other type of legal context. But many of them are concerned about something that's called joint and several liability, which is a particular law that allows, let's say, a plaintiff to sue let's say a group of individuals, think of um, maybe a multi-car crash where there could be 
uh, multiple parties at fault, multiple defendants at mm-hmm. fault. And in certain states, the laws allow the plaintiff to really recover, let's say, 100 percent of that liability from any one defendant. They could they could try to go after each individually and maybe split it or they could try to get 100 percent from one defendant. And that's a really big exposure that a lot of the families that we work with have in terms of, God forbid, they were in some sort of situation where, again, because of their perceived deep pockets, that they would be targeted uh, you know, to, to come up with 100% of that legal liability. Yeah, of course. No, I mean, that, that paints a huge target on them. So that I can imagine being in that position. It, it's scary. And, um, you know, fortunately, there are, there are ways that you can protect that, which we'll get into. Uh, the one, one of the, the second risks, which sort of is related to the first, is really having proper insurance coverage that, that can protect the family. And that's really one area that we see, uh, unfortunately, families, whether it's an auto coverage or umbrella coverage, they, they, they're not properly covered for those risks were they to occur. And some of these personal injury suits, again, depending on the state that, you're, that you live in, could reach into the millions, tens of millions of dollars, depending on, on the circumstances. And so having necessary coverage to protect your family's assets is really important because if the coverage is, let's say, for $2 million, but the uh, award to the plaintiff is $10 million, well, you have an $8 million difference there that the family may be responsible for for coming up and, and, and covering that difference. And so usually insurance professionals really will recommend that a family have an umbrella coverage or total coverage on the liability insurance side that equals their net worth. And so that's one thing that most insurance professionals will recommend. And most states have laws that you have to have automobile insurance to even to drive your car. But sure. they don't they don't have laws that require or at least none of the states that I can think of have a law that says you have to have an umbrella coverage or umbrella policy. Can you just give our audience just a, a quick view of what an umbrella policy is and why that's important or what that really does? Well, an umbrella coverage, it really covers beyond, let's say you're in this case, your automobile insurance coverage or your homeowner's insurance coverage. Usually there are limits in those coverages that will cover up to a certain amount uh, of damages. And then above and beyond that, they will stop their coverage. The umbrella coverage then kicks in after that to cover any excess. And those are pretty affordable from what I understand. Relatively so. I, I mean, uh, they, they tend to be for especially if you're a high income, high net worth earner in the grand scheme of things, they tend to be pretty affordable. I know that's somewhat of a relative uh, question yeah. or relative answer, but uh, they tend to be pretty affordable, especially if you're considering the the extent that you could be held liable. Most of the families that we work with don't find it a big burden to, to cover that excess. Got it. Got it. Any more with risk number two for the, the lack of proper insurance? Uh, no, I think that's that's pretty much it. Again, it's it's really related to number one in terms of the lawsuits, but I think that covers really the the extent of of number two there. All right, what's number three? Number three is is marital separation and inheritance, and this is really getting into maybe a little bit of the trust conversation on the estate planning side. But uh, marital separation and divorce is unfortunately uh, something that's. Uh, really, it's it's becoming more prevalent. It affects probably between forty and fifty percent of of all marriages in the United States. Uh, if you are in a second or third marriage, those rates tend to be even higher than that. Mm. And so, many of the families that we work with are highly concerned about protecting their own assets, were they to be divorced or have a marital separation, mm. but also in terms of protecting their heirs, whether children or descendants or other extended family members from uh, a possible separation, marital separation, and having the family wealth and the assets exposed to that, that particular separation. Um, Dad, I think this is one of the, prob- probably, especially in the estate planning side, one of the uh, probably most detailed conversations we have with them. I, I, it, it becomes a very, very important conversation in the, in the estate planning process in particular. Yeah, they often, they often are, are overly concerned, and, and, and rightly so, about that let's assume they're married to uh, their husband for 10 or 15 years. They have three wonderful children to that marriage. And now they decide to separate, get divorced. The, the key is what happens to the assets to that family legacy from the three original children from that marriage if one of them to remarry another particular uh, future spouse. Mm. So how do you protect those assets via documents, uh, trust to prevent 
those particular assets go to the wrong children. It's a, it's a big concern our families have. So how do you, I mean, everybody knows the word prenup, right? But now, now they're married and there is no prenup because they didn't do one originally. How do you overcome those issues if you're starting in the midst of it? They've been married 10, 15 years, and now they're thinking about it. How is that possible to protect that for those kids? Well, again, that, well, for the children, it becomes a little bit of a different conversation in terms of how you design maybe an estate plan to accomplish that. Now, if there's been a, a marriage that's that's been in existence in your example for, say, 10 to 15 years, and the husband or, or wife is concerned about them, they themselves getting separated and they don't have a prenuptial agreement, that, again, is very dependent on state law. So each state has their own uh, separation laws with how that would play out. So it's a little bit beyond the scope of what we can talk about. But there are certain things like postnuptial agreements that you could enter into mm. uh, to help protect that, which is really a prenup, but <laughs> occurs after the marriage, which is why they call it a postnup agreement. So th- that that's a fairly common practice that you could or agreement that you could uh, execute to take it to, to um, protect that. Got it. All right. What other risks are we need to talk about today? Well, I think let's let's talk a little bit. Dad, why don't you talk a little bit about some of the conversations we have with families on getting into the trust conversation in terms of protecting children's assets from, let's say, the in-laws and outlaws and how, how we look at designing estate plans with families and maybe some of the, the stories and, and things that families have shared with us on how we design that. Yeah. Uh, to continue what I said a, f- a few minutes ago, uh, on the estate side, let's assume one of the parents or both parents pass away. What happens to the assets? Where do they go? Where's the governance? Where's the education being mm. uh, developed to teach the children about wealth? Trusts are used in that format to protect those assets for, from Michael said earlier, potential in-laws and outlaws. Uh, to, and, and those assets are, could be protected for a generation or, or more. Or they could have distributions from the trust over time. They could be co-trustees of those trusts to help manage the assets. There's a lot of very creative ways to keep the kids involved with the trust designs, but not expose those assets to creditors. Every family is different we work with, but one clear piece is they want to make sure those assets are protected for generations if possible uh, using these flexible trusts. And there, and then you mentioned a few in your preamble, slats, or uh, they are specially designed irrevocable trusts. They'll allow uh, the family assets to be protected, but you have access through your lifetime. I won't get into the weeds with, with the design of it, but there are very, very flexible trusts that allow not only the mother or father to have access to it, but if they were to pass prematurely, the kids would have this similar flexibility in these trusts as well, depending on the language in these trusts. I would and, think- and one of the things that we review, I, I, one, of, one of my roles within Copper Beach, as we talked about in our earlier podcast, our audit process. And so one of the things that I will do in that process is review the family's existing legal documents uh, on the estate planning side. And one of the most common provisions that I see in those documents are a plan that incorporates a trust, let's say for future generations, but very often those trusts expire at a certain point in time. Very typically it occurs at certain ages. So there may be a provision in the trust that says, at when a beneficiary of that trust turns age 25, then a certain percentage of the assets that are held in that trust pour out to that beneficiary outright and free of trust. And then at age 30, maybe it's another percentage. And then by the age 35 or 40, 100 percent of the, of the trust assets pour out to that beneficiary. And there's nothing inherently wrong with that line of thinking. But from an asset protection standpoint, you're the family has to understand that they're potentially exposing those assets to creditor claims by by pouring them out to the beneficiary directly. Now, I know in New Jersey, where we live, an inheritance that is received by a child, as an example, is not subject to a divorce decree, so long as they keep those assets in their own name and separate. But what very often happens is, let's say, a parent leaves assets to to a daughter, and the daughter takes those assets and they they commingle them with with her spouse, or she commingles them with her spouse. She puts it in a joint bank account, or they buy a vacation house that's titled in the name of both spouses. Well, once that happens, you're taking it out of that protected format, 
and and subjecting that to the claims of creditors. So trusts as a as a as a tool can be used to say, okay, we're going to, instead of pouring those assets out to, to my daughter in this example, we're going to leave them in trust and maybe the trust buys that vacation house. But because it's owned in that trust, it's not owned by, by the daughter or it cannot be titled in the name of the daughter and her spouse. It's protected in that trust format. So there, there are a lot of different ways that we can, we can design trust with the families we work with. And many of the families that we talk to are really unaware that that their trusts have that type of language or really aren't sure what the ramifications of that type of design in their trusts is. And, and they often ask us to, to help fix that with their estate attorney. Yeah, I'll tell you a short story. I had a client years ago who, when he was 25, his grandfather had a trust for his benefit. And when he was 25, a uh, sum of money paid out to him at that particular age. And uh, when I was talking with him, he said, by the time I was 27, it was all gone. He said, I mm. did crazy things with it. Mm-hmm. It was a lot of money. I didn't know how to direct it. It was mine. Uh, my parents had no power over it, and I kind of blew it. So I said, well, what did you do after that? He said, well, when I was 30, another chunk of money came out from this trust, and you'd think I'd learned. When I was 33, it was also all gone. I lent money oh, to no. friends. <laughs> I bought an investment property that didn't work out, and so on and so forth. He said, when I was 30, 38, I think the age was, the last distribution of trust was paying out to me. Um, and I created this, this wonderful asset. He, he ran a very successful business that was worth over $15 million at that time. I said, well, what happened? He said, I grew up. Mm-hmm. So it's interesting when you look at your children, they all mature differently. They all have different, uh, views of the world. And he was fortunate to understand it, uh, before he got to, before it was too late. So he took that last, um, sum of money and did something good with it. I.e. created a business. So that, so so education to the children are extremely important. And one more short story. I had another client who had three daughters and he wanted to put a certain amount of money away for the for his three daughters. And he's I don't want to never touch it. I want the trustee to make all the decisions and I want I, I don't want I don't want them to blow it because I'm really, really concerned about them, you know, misusing the assets. Mm-hmm. So through my dialogue with his name was Frank, I said, Frank, l- let's think of it differently. Let's talk about educating the girls as time goes on. Let's let them have access to a certain part of the trust to help manage the trust. In other words, let them hire a financial planner, let them get an idea how to invest the money, and teach them how to, how to, how to work with money. And he said, boy, that's a great idea. So instead of giving them 500, gave them both a million dollars, all three of a million dollars apiece. And the girls were, were very, very strong in understanding how to invest the assets, they hired financial planners, and it was a very, very successful venue. So there are ways you can use these trusts as tools to educate your children, develop a long-term strategy, but yet protect most of the assets from those mistakes that, that occur. One more story, and it's a sad one, where we've had cases where, as Michael said earlier, where the trust would pour out at certain ages. Mm-hmm. Let me ask you a quick question, Eric. If one of your children received $500,000 at a certain age, and they were a drug addict. How do you protect that? Yeah. What would happen to that money if they were hooked on drugs? Because drugs is rampant in the United States today. So that's a gr- that's a big conversation with our families where how do I protect all these risks of this money that I'm pouring out? Because I don't know what my kids are going to be 10, 15, 20 years from now. So those are some stories we come across with our clients. And these discussions are ongoing. But they look at these trusts as being key elements to their planning to add flexibility, control, uh, and most certainly asset protection. Yeah, I, I mean, that's you, you answered my question. Both of you just chimed in there. My next question was about that because, John, you had alluded earlier, if if you have you know the parents pass away and this money is given out, at 18 years old, when it came to money, I was dumb as a box of hammers. Okay. I mean, yeah, it's what, a, or we all <laughs> right. I mean, here's the thing. I didn't have any drug issues. I I've never had any drug issues or alcohol dependency or anything like that, but I still would have been just stupid with the money because of my other coping mechanisms, because what a lot of people don't think of, and I think this is a conversation that you guys have to have. It's, it's, you know, with them, just a little bit of reality into the world is if you were to pass, how would your children cope with that passing? And you brought it up. Some people that have dabbled with drugs, they may just, I just need to feel better. Mom and dad died and I'm sad. And so I need to feel better. So all of a sudden they have money and their coping mechanism is going to be drugs, alcohol, or whatever, or fast cars and, and, and stupidity, whatever that is to try to help them cope. I think parents need to realize that and be able to 
account for that in whatever trust that they choose or whatever you help them to shape just to say, hey, look, they're going to need to plow through this emotion and you can help set them up for success so they're not going to lean on things that are going to be unhealthy or deadly for them to cope with your with your passing. Yeah. And Michael, Michael is probably better suited to say this to you, but there's language in these trusts. They're called HEMS language. It's health, education, maintenance, and support. Oh. So think about if a trust is directed for those reasons to give money out to children or to beneficiaries, that drug issue pops up, health, education, maintenance, and support. Mm -hmm. It's very gray. That means they have to pay the pay the distribution out to the, to, to that particular bit you know fishery it's it's a it's a challenge for families to make sure the language in these trusts are written for that particular asset protection strategy they might have for their families and uh, it, it sort of this this is a very unique circumstance this certainly doesn't happen every day in families we, we work with an estate attorney who had a client uh, whose parents created a trust for them a very wealthy family and the beneficiary was uh, was a hypochondriac basically Mm. And the terms of the trust, as, as my father alluded to, there are certain language in there called health, education, maintenance, and support. So the health issue became very important. So this beneficiary would come up with some ailment that, that he had and would go to the doctor, go to all these very, very uh, expensive doctors and would say to the trustee, I, I need this for my health. And, it, and nothing would ever come up from, from these, uh, these visits to these medical professionals. Mm -hmm. But slowly but surely, the, the trust principle was eroded because of that language. And that was really, again, a very unique circumstance, but an, sort of an unintended consequence to these, to these trusts. And so a lot of the families that we work with, instead of using that health education, maintenance, and support language, they, they give the trustee full discretion to use the trust assets for the beneficiary's best interests, mm -hmm. which is even more of a gray area. So you can make an argument in, in this particular scenario where the beneficiary would, would call the trustee up and say, uh, Mr. Trustee, I, I feel like I have a knee pain. I need to go to the doctor. And the, and the trustee can say, well, you, you already went to three medical professionals about that knee issue and nothing came up. So I'm not going to make that distribution to you. So the trustee has the authority to say yes or no. And that's a much more of an asset protected language or, or, or design to these trusts that would have helped this particular beneficiary. So it, it's, I often like to think of it, there's no right answer to, to these decisions. There's a lot of different ways that you can design them. And unfortunately, it's never going to be perfect, but we have to really do a lot of design work with the families ongoing, not just once, but, but we review these documents almost every year with the families that we work with just to see if circumstances change because the language really does matter. The, these, these documents, they, they will go into effect at some point, and it's really important that the family understands what the ramifications of, of that language will be or could be. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of these documents are irrevocable. They can't be changed once they're written. So we spend hours on this topic with families just to make sure they have all their options that are available. Uh, they un understand all, all the, all the uh, consequences of each one or the benefits. So we go through a lot of discussion and, and it's a, it's a really a fun conversation in part, uh, because the, the clients get real excited about understanding how these trusts could possibly work for their behalf of their family. And, and it's, it's just a, it's a relief when they say, I understand these documents. Now I understand how flexible they are. I understand the impact it has from a family. Let's move forward and meet with the attorney and it, and it works real, real well. Yeah, that's fantastic. All right. The great thing about being the host is that you guys sent me these risks ahead of time so I could take a look at them. And risk number four is actually substance abuse or addiction. And we've spoken a lot about that uh, just by covering risk three as well. Is there anything else we need to add to uh, risk number four? Well, I think we, t I think we covered a, a good amount of that topic. And it's, it's one of those risks that obviously you hope this never happens to, to your family. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we obviously hope it never happens to your family. But fortunately, it can. And, and it, it affects people of all socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, all net worth levels. And so it's one of those things that, again, you hope it never happens. But it's something to you know, keep in the back of your mind when you're designing these, these estate plans for your for future generations, especially if these trusts can go on for hundreds of years sometimes. And so it becomes really important to sort of think about all of these different issues, that in particular. Yeah. And, and or just your average family who has just a desire to make sure whatever money they have um, after they pass away, it could be any amount that their kids 
get that money uh, as as protected as possible. Yeah, a- absolutely. And the thing is, is that I've dealt with lots of families, I've worked with lots of families very closely that have had substance abuse in their family and they're in all different stages. So I would encourage you, if you're listening to this podcast and you're interested in talking to John and Michael, if you're experiencing that in your family, there's no shame. There's no guilt in that. It's not a taboo subject. It happens and you still want to protect your children as best you can. So you, you definitely need to be to the point where you can accept the fact that that's an issue and that you can openly talk to them about it because they can definitely help protect those kids in the future should something happen to you and if you want to create that trust. So um, don't be afraid to, to bring it up. It's not a shameful subject. It happens and, and we just move forward. So, hey guys, thank you so much. I think we are out of time and we're going to cover the the rest of the risks. Well, that's a hard one to say. The rest of the risks in the next podcast. Is that okay with you? It sounds great. Looking forward Thanks, to it. Thanks, Eric. Yes, it does. All right. And thank you for listening to the Truth of Your Wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below. This way, when John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Thanks again for listening. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services Incorporated, a member of FINRA SIPC Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors Incorporated, an SEC registered investment advisor. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of APFS and APA. Any opinions expressed in this forum are not the opinion or view of American Portfolios Financial Services Incorporated APFS or American Portfolios Advisors Incorporated APA and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions.